I'd like everybody to stand, please. Everybody stand. And ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the founder, the pastor, the angel of this house, Dr. Rod Parsley, as he comes to share with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Elder Canfield. Take that down, partner. And uh, happy 65th birthday. Not today, but a few days ago. And uh, he's enjoying that fly, fly, what is it called? Fly fishing lure, fly tying yeah. situation. We got him for his birthday, and we are so thankful for his ministry to us now for how many years? 30, how many years? Elder? 37, sir. 37 years. Yeah. I don't look 37 years old. <laughs> Why aren't you laughing? Laugh louder, pull your mask down and laugh, so I know you're laughing. That's great. Let's welcome all the hundreds and hundreds of folks joining us live tonight, our great online World Valor Christian College students. So uh, I'm not really supposed to be the one up here tonight. In just a few moments, you are going to be graced by a son of this house, a spiritual son of mine, and his wife, a Valor Christian College graduate back when it was WHBI. And uh, Pastor Miles Rutherford is going to turn loose on you. And I, I don't know what he's going to do, but I saw his son bring in a bow and arrow. So you get ready. He's got a great, great word for you. I've been sharing with you a little bit, and I'll share just a little bit more tonight since we have a guest. And then whatever Pastor Miles doesn't use up of our class time tonight, I'm sure Elder Canfield has both barrels loaded, as he always does. And we thank him for that. So I've been sharing with you some things that uh, Brother Sumrall taught me, Dr. Lester Sumrall taught me. Uh, I, I put together about 10 of them right quick. I'll share a couple of them with you tonight. First of all, we start Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember. Now, understand that when God says remember, there's always a reason. And the reason is because he knew that you and I would forget. So he says, tie a spiritual forget-me-not around your heart strings and remember those which have the rule over you. Everybody say the word rule. Some folks say teach a child in the way it should go, and when it's old, it won't depart from it. But that's not what God said. God said train up a child. There's a great, great deal of difference if you've ever been involved, especially with animals, is a good illustration for it, between teaching a horse and training a horse. There are some things that are necessary in the training that will make the horse uncomfortable with the current situation. So if you have a, quote, spiritual leader in your life of any kind that never, ever makes you uncomfortable, all you have is a friend. I thought I heard somebody say something. I said, all you have is a friend because a son loves the chastening because he understands he grows thereby, which means he's not going to grow unless he has the chastening. I can tell everything about you the very first time I have to bring correction to you. In the way you receive correction tells me everything I need to know about you. So God's saying, remember those who what? Have the rule over you. This is something we do not understand again about spiritual authority. And as I've told you before, I believe, I, I preach and teach so much now, I can't remember which one group of people I was in when, in front of when. But if you ever want to understand the absolute biblical truth and reality of spiritual authority, you need to get Watchman Nee's book on spiritual authority, and you need to commit as much of it as you can to memory. So I've taught you, right? Love books. Love books. 
mark it up, tear it up, fold down the pages, and you'll get to the point where other books will be like your Bible, where you, you may not know the chapter and verse, but you know about where it is, and you know on which side of the page it is, and you know which column it is. So get, get used to handling books. Now, we didn't used to have to say that, but to your generation, we have to say that. By the way, I really enjoy your social media. You do a great job. Did you see the comments I made to you? You did? Did you show everybody and say, look, Pastor Rod commented on my thing? You did? <laughs> That's right. That's right. You do a great, great job, Ashton. Get to know her. She is excellent on social media. And so that have the rule over you. The rule over you. A uniform is necessary in virtually every kind of a profession. It may not be called a uniform, but there is a code of dress. There's a dress code. There's also a code of conduct. And it is by your submission to authority that you receive freedom. It's real quiet in here. It's real quiet in here. Because if you receive a directive from somebody who is a, an authority, unless it's to break a law, and you perform whatever it is they directed you to do, and it was all wrong, you have the great uh, relief of saying, it's not on me. You put me under thus and so, and I did what thus and so said. Therefore, the responsibility for those actions are on them, not on me. So it's freeing for you to have authority in your life. Remember those who rule over you. You ought to write down three or four people in your life that you feel like have true rulership over you. Again, I didn't say your friend that always tells you you're right and tells you what you want to hear and agrees with everything you say. I'm talking about somebody that will point their finger at your nose and tell you the truth. The greatest downfall among modern preachers, and I'm talking about from the 1800s on, their greatest downfall is that they constantly surround themselves with yes people who will not tell them the truth for fear. They're fearful of losing their position. They're fearful of losing their paycheck. They're fearful of falling out of favor with whoever that is. So I can tell everything about you by how you respond to correction. Remember those, isn't that amazing? I got all of that out of Remember those who have the rule over you. You ought to write down three people that have rulership in your life right now. What does that mean? That means you would hear them as you hear God. No buts, no well what ifs, no well I. You understand their authority in your life. Now don't lie to the Holy Ghost. We'll have to carry you out like Ananias and Sapphira. Remember those who have the rule over you, second part, who have spoken the word of God to you. Now, spoken, that means under the anointing, they've taken the flaming finger of the Holy Ghost and engraved on the fleshly tablets of your heart the word of God. They put the word in you. We're not talking about teachers. We're talking about they put the word in you to the point that it altered who you are. That's the distinction, you see. Spoke the word of God to you. Then, after those two things, people say, well, I, I want an impartation of faith. Well, you can receive an impartation of any spiritual gift and of any anointing, but you have to get through step one and step two first. Number one, you have to find people that have rule over you whose voices you hear as you would hear God. Number two, they have to have spoken the word of God to you that altered who you are. Now, when you find that, then, he says, imitate their faith and considering the result of their conduct or conversation, another translation said, considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. So you can only imitate the faith 
truly of those, and faith is mountain-moving, yoke-destroying, burden-removing, mountain-moving faith. I'm not talking about, you know, you believe to get a better car. I'm talking about faith that shakes kingdoms. I'm talking about faith that dethrones principalities and powers. I'm talking about faith that makes the devil get up and be nervous because he knows you're awake that makes principalities and powers in certain areas of the nation, when you step your foot on the ground, they know you have now taken authority. That kind of faith. Amen? So that kind of faith is only available to those whom you imitate their faith because you have submitted to their authority or rulership and they have spoken the word of God to you in a way that altered your life. Okay, everybody got that? Okay, 1 Corinthians 4.15. For if you were to have 10,000 instructors, teachers, spiritual gurus, flatterers, speaking sweet, swelling, swirling words, that just lift you in your emotions and you just feel so much better. No, no, no. We're not talking about you may have 10,000 of those, but watch what it said, yet you do not have many fathers. Now, Elder Canfield has watched this through the years. The number of thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have come through here and claimed me as a spiritual father. And I always warn them, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Because the minute you say that, you, you change my relationship to you. Because I am a father, I am not an instructor. You understand? So you have 10,000 instructors, but you have few fathers in Christ Jesus uh, I have become a father to you through the gospel. All right, so what are we talking about a father? Give me the next verse. A father is one who produces a plan through foreknowledge. Get it all, don't just get part of it. A father is one who produces a plan through foreknowledge producing through foreknowledge a plan of two things, provision and protection for those of his own house, for those of his own house. He does this through foreknowledge. He does this through the Spirit. He sees ahead prophetically. And uh, 1 Timothy 5, 8 is where we take that from. But if any provide not for those of his, for those provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied, there we are, the faith, and is worse than, can't just read the Bible, got to read the Bible, worse than, not an infidel, worse than an infidel. Now it's bad enough to be an infidel. An infidel is a person who rules or makes decisions based on their sensory mechanisms, what they see naturally, what they feel naturally, how they feel naturally. Do you understand? All right. So what then would a person be that is a father who truly provides for those of his own house spiritually. Well, first of all, he has to have a plan. He has to have a plan. No, 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 you're not listening. The plan is about you, not about them. He has to have a plan, which is, which is brought to him through foreknowledge, through looking ahead, through praying, through fasting. He sees the direction. He sees the end goal, or she, all right? And uh, is not an infidel. So they don't make decisions like pastors who make people board members of their church who, who because they check their giving records. 
You're not listening to me. You're just staring at me. You're just staring at me. And that's how those people think they run the ministry, you see. God only appoints a man and a family to lead a ministry. Everybody else is called in support of those gifts and that ministry, period. Elder Canfield is an elder here. In fact, he's the senior elder here. But he doesn't make business decisions here. We don't vote together about what color. When I, when I said I need to change this platform, he, we didn't call everybody together and have a vote. Why? Well, we never have. We never have. God didn't call me and my family. Dr. Oral Roberts taught me this when I was in my late 20s. God didn't call us. He said, Rod, God didn't call somebody else to build this university. He called and anointed me and my family to build this university. And so he said, in every chapel at the beginning of every year at ORU, I tell the students, I'm so glad you're here. But while you're here, remember this. God didn't use me to raise this up to argue with anybody. So we can look at each other and we can disagree. And if we can't come into agreement, then I will bless you in your going and you bless me in my remaining. Do you understand? The kingdom of God is not a democracy. Thank God for that. I said thank God for that. And besides that, the United States is not a democracy to begin with. It's a democratic republic. The majority does not rule. Look, did you ever take civics? Do you know how the, the nation functions? Do you know how many senators there are? Do you know how many members of the House of Representatives there are? Do you know how many members of the Supreme Court there have been for 150 years? Do you know how a bill is passed? then what right do you think you have to vote? You don't even know how the thing operates. Figure out how it operates first. And stop being moved by personality cults. That's what the church is these days. Here we go. Here we go. So Brother Summerall taught, Dr. Summerall taught me to be a father, not to be an instructor. He also taught me that timing is everything. Timing is everything. He taught me that I must, if I wanted to be as he was, right in the middle of every major move of God during his lifetime, from the time he was 17 till 82 when he went to be with the Lord, he was a part of, in the center of the circumference of every major move of God that happened on the earth. And he said, in order to do that, you cannot be unable to adjust your sails. I heard pastor preaching this morning in Valor Christian College Chapel. You've got to be able to adjust. You have to be able to sense when things are shifting and you have to be able to accommodate and support that shift. Most people, write this down, will never in their spiritual existence progress beyond their first revelation of God. Whatever they came in under, that's what they're going to stay under the rest of their life. But Brother Summerall taught me to adjust my sails. If you don't feel the wind filling your spiritual sails, it's not because God's wind stopped blowing. It's because your sails are pitched in the wrong direction. So you have to adjust to catch the wind. Somebody say yes. And you have to do that in your family. And you have to do that in your business. Pastor Evans Karayuki and I were together on the phone today for about 45 minutes because he's going through a transition in his business and I helped him find the wind in his business. You understand? Hallelujah. So here's a good one. Don't seek to do anything great. 
Now these are things he taught me with my knees against his where he would sit and talk to me for hours. Not just, you know, some little fly-by-night thing. Well, I came over and spent a day at World Harvest, so I got all that anointing. Don't seek to do anything great, but do something all the time. Do something all the time. What are you doing when you lay your head down at night? What did you move forward? What is different because God allowed you to breathe air that day? Amen? Brother Summerhall and I were in a, in a hotel lobby, one of those two big hotels they have in the Dallas Fort Worth, DFW, Dallas Fort Worth Airport. And we were in the lobby waiting on them to send, you know, they always send a limousine in those days from TBN to pick you up if you were going to be hosting or a guest on the program. So we were there and we were going to guest together, Brother Summerall and I, two generations together, to talk about end time events. We were just sitting there in the lobby, but he used every opportunity for training. And he looked over at me and he said, you know, this is the greatest, largest, most widespread Christian television broadcasting network in the world. And I said, yes, sir, I'm aware of that. And uh, what you don't know is Brother Summerall owned a network of about 10 television stations called Lassie Broadcasting. And he was the first one to put me on more stations than the local station here in Columbus uh, when I was 20, 28, 27 years old. So we were sitting there and he looked at me and he said, you know, if you and I just picked one thing that we do, and that's all we did, it would become the greatest, whatever that is, that there has ever been. And then he patted me, and he said, don't ever be that. Don't ever be that. Don't be a specialist. Don't pick out part of the gospel, and that's what you always emphasize. God, he said, if you want longevity, don't be a specialist. And I said, that's right. My mother used to get aggravated at me like Joni and Ashton Blair in Austin get aggravated at me now. They say, why do you go so hard? Why don't you sit down? Why do you have to do class tonight? You got Elder Canfield there. You got the great preacher, uh, Dr. Miles Rutherford there. Why do you have to go in and do that? I have to because I have to do something all the time. You understand? All the time. Idle hands are the devil's tool. I promise you, you sit down and the next thing you know, you'll be doing things you never dreamed you would do because you are idle. Don't ever idle. Walk out there. Realize there's a giant to slay. I said hallelujah. I said there's a giant to slay. Is there not a cause if you can't do anything else, pray. Turn the dadgum television off. Watching a bunch of people putting their spirits all over you. Pentecostals, we're something else. We believe that there's transference of spirits, but we don't care one bit to go sit down, spend time with rank sinners. Well, I sat at the table with them, but I wasn't drinking. Shame on you. What a disparity you are to the body of Christ. Shame on you. Stop it. Come out from among them and be separate. You want to tell me that you can receive by the laying on of hands or by being in the presence of someone, spiritual impartation. Of course, when it's the devil's crowd, you don't think there's impartation, and then you don't understand why you act the way you do. I'm helping somebody. Do something for God all the time. All the time. Be busy. People that talk about burnout annoy me. I was with Brother Sumrall 
in Oklahoma. It wasn't in Tulsa, but it wasn't far from Tulsa. And a pastor had built a new building. And I was speaking one night. Dr. Summerall was speaking one night. Dr. Kenneth E. Hagan was speaking one night. And I was right in the middle of the sandwich of that greatness. And, uh, and Brother Copeland came with Gloria, and they stayed all three nights. So that was the kind of meeting we're in. Well, this pastor got up, and he started talking about he was going to build a burnout center for preachers. And under his breath, Brother Summerall said, there's no such thing. He said, there's no such thing. And when he got up, he said, I guess some of you, and he grinned a little bit. He said, I guess some of you heard me say about that about preachers. He said, preachers don't burn out, they sin out. You're not listening to me. He said, if a preacher burns out, it tells you one thing. They're doing 90% of what they do in their flesh. Because the spirit of a man is renewed day by day, and the spirit of a man sustains all of his infirmity. A great man, Ashton Blair and I, went to lunch with he and his wife last week, and uh, he's, he, he is a very, 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 very successful man. He's 92 years old. He's 92 years old. He goes to his office every day and is there at 8 o'clock. Some of you don't want a class at 8 o'clock. 92 years old. COVID-19 attacked his body. I said, look at you. You're the picture of health. He said, I threw that thing off. I've got work to do. I'll tell you another thing he taught me. Have I taken too much time? Okay. Here was a good one. Never, ever be alone unless you are in your prayer closet with God or you're studying the Word. You listening? Do you know when most preachers quit? You know when most preachers sin? After they have preached and given their hearts and their bodies and their minds in a pulpit and then they go back to some stupid hotel by themselves. Preacher asked me one time, he said, well, aren't you, I know the way you preach. I preached about two hours that night in a great breakthrough crusade. I believe it was in North Carolina. And uh, there were a lot of preachers there and this well-known preacher was staying in the hotel to be a part of of the breakthrough meeting. And he said, now I look at you and you can barely stand up. He said, now when you get up there in that hotel room, you mean to tell me that you're not tempted to get in that little mini bar and get you one of those little bottles to help you go to sleep? I said, what in the world would I need that to go to sleep for? And besides that, if I tried to do it, the people with me would stop me. I hear her preachers all the time talk about women waiting on them outside their hotel room. Well, there's a reason for that. You give off that spirit. I tell people all the time, I must be the ugliest human being there has ever been. And Miss Joni said, it's not that at all. It's that you don't give off anything from you that would make anybody ever think that you would be susceptible to such a thing. You don't fall into sin. Quit making excuses for yourself and repent. That's why I'm raising up 100,000 people beginning this week to pray with me for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to fall on sin and saints. Never alone. Never alone. I got made fun of 
because I was single till I was 20. Now, this, I'm just giving you this as a reference point for whatever you do in life. It doesn't just have to be ministry. What are you doing in a car with somebody that's not your spouse? For any reason. Somebody gets in a car with me, they'll be in the back seat. What? Yeah, but people know they work for you all the worse. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. Don't be alone. I got made fun of. Mother Parsley traveled with me and Darren Endicott for the first 10 or 15 years of ministry. I never went anywhere without the two of them, ever. And nobody ever said I was with a woman and nobody ever said I was drunk and they sure enough didn't say I was with a man. Promise you that right now. I'm not going to say it. I'm, there's a little joke that goes with that, but I won't say it. Amen? You don't need to be alone. Oh, that goes for dating couples too. Half the people shouting at me right now, do it. Anyway, I'm praying the convicting power of God on you. What? Why do you need to be alone? What, what are you going to do at your apartment that you need to be alone? And nothing good happens after midnight. Just write it down. Unless you're praying. Ashton, enjoy that. Um, nothing I'm doing. You getting it? Nothing I've ever done. Nothing I'm doing is as great as what I'm just about to do. Ah! Glory to God. Like I don't have anything to do. And God tells me, raise up a hundred thousand people praying for the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. That's what America needs. That's what our church is. Oh, we need revival. You can't get revival without conviction, and you can't get an awakening without a revival. Uh, I heard a young man say something today. He said, hope looks backward and faith looks forward. That was Pastor Miles Rutherford. Isn't that powerful? Write it down. Don't ever lose it. 20 years from now, when you're going through a crisis, you'll pull that up out of your spirit. Hallelujah to God. He taught me that writing is the key to longevity. Writing. Not preaching, writing. I'll tell you this and then I'm finished. I would often stay with him in the hotel because I comforted him. I cared for him. I didn't have to have my own room so I could watch porn after he went to bed. And I would comfort him. I would fix his bed. I would get his bed clothes out. I would put his other clothes away. I would do anything I could for him. I would to God I could do it today. I would wash his feet. He had trouble with his feet. And I would help him into bed, knowing he wouldn't be there long. He usually got up every night about 3 o'clock. And if I was in the room with him, he'd go into the bathroom of the hotel room. And he would put down the seat. And he would sit on the bathtub. And he would write for hours what God was saying to him. About 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, he'd wake me up. I let you sleep in this morning. Let's go get some breakfast and talk to some preachers. Okay. That's why I've written over 100 books. 
over 100 books. He taught me that. You learn. You learn to be a wordsmith when you write. Because it's staring, isn't it, El Canfield? It's staring back at you. And you can hear it. Hallelujah. I sure do love you. I said, I sure do love you. Okay, what time is it? 6.55? Okay, so if we break now, no, 6.55. You got an hour and a half left. Well, I'll tell you one more thing then. Uh, uh, let me see. I'll tell you about He said I know who I am. And that took me back a little bit. But then he said, I know where I fit. He said, if this thing's on a scale of one to 10, I know where I fit. <laughs> Most people ruin their lives because they never determine who they are and where they fit. He said, I know preachers that are in a word greater than me. They have a different position than me. They have a higher, if you will, position than me. I'm not at the bottom, and I'm not the one at the very top. I know exactly where I am. And that gives me peace because I never strive to be something I'm not. Other people's expectations will destroy you. You must know God's expectations. Because if you don't know where you fit, how do you show honor? I can tell you this, Dr. Sumrall, one of the men he respected most in the world was a gentleman from Sweden named Levi Petrus. He conducted the greatest Pentecostal revival in Norway, Sweden, and Finland, Scandinavia. What a powerful man he was. When we were in Sweden, as we were together many, many times, he took me to where Levi Petrus preached on Sundays, and we just sat there in the glory and the power of God and prayed together. He had great and tremendous respect, of course, for the great teacher Howard Carter and for the great evangelist Smith Wigglesworth. He had tremendous respect for many of the healing revival evangelists, so many of whom ended in ruin because they had such great gifting and they did not have enough word in them to sustain it. Do you know that the anointing that Catherine Kuhlman carried, she said God offered it to at least 10 people in that service that day, all men, and all 10 of them refused it. And she said, I'll take it. She did have a few people around her that cared for her. Not a lot, but a few. And so he also had tremendous respect. I think maybe the greatest respect uh, for Dr. Billy Graham. Although... Dr. Graham was not Pentecostal nor charismatic. He was a Baptist, a Southern Baptist. And Brother Sumrall, a neo-Pentecostal. But what he respected was the number of souls that he won. He said he gave his whole life 
to win a soul his whole life. And uh, he said, if you know where you fit, you will respect. You will have respect. You will have greatness because you will learn humility. Never think that you're the only one that can do what you do. Never think that you are not expendable to God. God will get his will and purpose done whether you obey him or not. He's God. Now, he might let you go along with him and bless you, but if you want to walk, walk away from his anointing, he'll find somebody else to pick it up. Heaven will not suffer, and hell will become just as depopulated. God's always got a people. He's always got a man. He's always got a woman. He's always got a remnant. And so if you happen to find yourself in that, rejoice and be glad that he's chosen you worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. Hallelujah. All right, I used up my time. It's 701. So how long of a break are we going to give them before my tremendous, tremendous friend, Pastor Miles Rutherford, is going to come and bless them? And if he leaves any time, my pastor, Elder Canfield, is going to bless you. We, oh, come on, Elder, give him 10. You, I, I begged for 10. Oh, Lord, for 10 minutes will you spare the students. He will spare you for 10 minutes. Go now, yay. And be thou encouraged.